Go ahead and take your Bibles, open them to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where we'll be this morning. And um, quite the introduction from Pastor Skelly, I appreciate that. Uh, So a lot to live up to now. Um, I'm only popular among about 100 people in America. So uh, anyways, it's great to be with you guys. First time in Australia, and uh, I love it. I love it. You guys are so welcoming. Uh, Just the culture in general just seems to be so welcoming. Faith Baptist Church, your people are just incredibly welcoming from the moment we walked in the door the other night for the very first time. Just felt like we've been at home. And so thank you so much for that, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning, and thank all of you uh, for being here, coming to TNS this year. Uh, It's it's been a great experience, and I'm looking forward to the last couple of days here. Uh, So the theme, obviously, for, for the week has been my church, and I thought this morning it would be appropriate for us just to take a few moments and look at what is God's vision for the church And not just for the church, because I think oftentimes in our spiritual lives in general, uh, we like to we like to generalize things rather than making them personal. Uh, But what what is God's vision for you specifically and me specifically in our individual local bodies of believers, our local churches, because at the end of the day, The church that you attend, the the, the church that you're here with as a part of this conference is your church. And you are that church. Because what do we know about churches? Churches are living organisms, right? Churches are not buildings. This building is beautiful, but this building is not Faith Baptist Church. Faith Baptist Church is the people of this building. That's that's what makes up Faith Baptist Church. And we come to Acts chapter 2, and you know this already, but what we see in Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of what we know today as the local church. This is Pentecost. This is when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church. This is the birth of the local church. Acts is an amazing book. Uh, Just a lot of interesting things begin to happen in the book of Acts. Let me just give you some real quick context of the whole book because I think it will help us as we develop our thoughts this morning. Chapter 1, we see Jesus actually leaving the earth. Jesus ascends and he promises the Holy Spirit. By the way, praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit, right, who convicts us who encourages us, who challenges us, who seals us until the day of redemption. And so we see that in chapter 1. Then chapters 2 through 7, we see uh, the ministry beginning in Jerusalem, the local church, of course, being birthed, and then uh, the, 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 the church spreading and the gospel beginning its spread. Chapters 8 through 12, we see the gospel going to Judea and Samaria, and then the rest of the, 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 rest of the book, we see it going to the ends of the earth. So Acts Acts is an amazing book. In Acts chapter 2, here's what we see real quick. A breakdown. Verses 1 through 13. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church of God. And you you can read that and and see that for yourself. Verses 14 through 40, Peter preaches this incredibly powerful message there. And then verses 40 through 47, which is what we're going to look at this morning. The church is born. Let me just say before I pray and we jump in this morning, can you just ask God this morning? I know we've got an an amazing day in front of us, looking forward to, to getting to the zoo. But this morning, as we hear God's word preached right now, as we go to our breakout sessions in just a few minutes, can can you just take a minute as I pray and just ask God what he wants to do in your life this morning? Because here's what I believe. Anytime the word of God is preached, anytime it's shared, God wants to do something in the hearts and the minds of those that are hearing God's word. And so just ask God this morning, God, what do you want to do in my heart? What do you, what do you want to do in my life? How can I be surrendered to you today? What areas of my life are maybe not surrendered to you? How can I have a greater impact in my church? Father, we love you. Now, thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to open your word and just spend a few minutes this morning together looking at what is your vision for each of us? What is your vision for your church? But specifically, God, what is your vision for me? What is your vision for each and every one of us inside of our local church? God, would you help us this morning? Would you challenge our hearts God, where conviction is necessary this morning in this room, would you convict? 
Maybe where some encouragement is necessary in someone's life this morning, would you encourage them? But God, I pray that as we leave this morning and go to the zoo and, and carry on throughout the day, that, 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 that we would leave different than when we walked in. We would leave encouraged. We would leave invigorated to serve you. And God, I pray that you would help us to do just that this morning. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for Jesus. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Look at Acts chapter 2. Skip on down to verse number 42. We're going to spend all of our time this morning really in verses 42 through 47. The Bible says this, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily, don't miss that, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So here's what happens. The early church catches God's vision and God begins to do, through these people, God begins to do incredible things. Here's my challenge to you this morning. Have you caught God's vision for your life? Have you caught God's vision for you in your local church? Because for each of us, God has a place in each, each and every one of our local churches. He has a purpose for us. God has gifted you with a gift. If, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when you accepted Jesus, you received a gift. And God expects each of us to put that gift to work in our church. So what is God's vision for you within your local church? Here's what I believe God's vision for the church is. Let me just give you this. If you're taking notes, you may want to write this down. It's a little lengthy. I'll say it a couple times. It's, I, I believe that God's vision for the local church is this, that we together radically pursue Jesus Christ. While fellowshipping in unity with one another, with fellow believers, for the purpose of worshiping our Savior and making disciples of Jesus. Okay, so let me say that again. Here's what I believe that God's vision is for each and every one of our local churches, and then by proxy for each of us. I believe that God's vision for us is that we radically pursue Jesus Christ. What does that mean? Well, that, that means that we put aside all of our other desires, and we make him preeminent in our lives. So, so my, my first question to you this morning is, is Jesus number one in your, in your life? Is, like, is he preeminent? Is he the most important thing in your life? I know we all have important things to us. We all have jobs. Those are important. We all have family. That's important. We, we, we all have hobbies that are important to us. But is Jesus the, the number one thing in your life? Is he preeminent in your life? That's what it means to radically pursue Jesus Christ. So what's God's vision for the church? Is that we radically pursue Jesus while fellowshipping in unity. Now, I, I think across the world, certainly where we come from in the United States, we are incredibly divided today. But I think that's true really across the world. So as the, the, the church of Christ, as believers who are scattered all over this world, one of the things that we ought to be striving for, and I love it because I see it here in this conference, is unity. You think about it. I mean, we are nine, almost 10,000 miles from home, yet we can come to a place like this and feel like we're at home because of the unity that believers have with one another. And so what's the purpose of the church? What's God's vision for the church? It's to radically pursue Jesus while fellowshipping in unity with other believers, what we're doing at this conference, for the purpose of worshiping our Savior. We did that this morning. We sang praises to God. We've done that the last several nights for the purpose of worshiping our Savior and making disciples of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, that, that's my second question to this, us this morning. Are you on mission? Because God's vision for the church is what I just told you, to radically pursue Jesus. But are we on mission? Because the mission that God has called each of us to is that we are making disciples of Jesus Christ. So how are we doing? How am I doing? How are you doing in your personal life in making disciples of Jesus Christ? Like, is that something that's important to you? Sharing your faith, letting other people know that, hey, yes, I'm a young adult. Yes, I, I, I love Jesus. And yes, I'm going to serve him with my life. 
One of the things that does the most damage to the cause of Christ in our world today is hypocrisy. It's young adults. It's older adults. It's children and teenagers who say, I know Jesus and I love Jesus, but their life doesn't match their words. So are we making disciples of Jesus Christ? And so here's what we see in the passage. I think we see three things, three three things that I'm going to share with you this morning. There are others, but we don't have time for them. But the three things I want us to really focus on this morning in this passage, God's vision for the church, here they are. I'm going to give them to you, and then we're going to talk about them. We're going to be done. Number one, the first thing that I see the early church doing here in the book of Acts is they're following God. So if I can call it this, fellowship. That's the first thing that I see. Look back at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 42. The Bible says this in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. Actually, go back to verse 41. We'll start there. Then they that gladly received him, received his word, excuse me, were baptized. And listen to this. The same day. The the same day, they were added to the church. This is right after that incredible message that's been preached by Peter. The same day they were added to the church. How many souls? Help me out. How many? 3,000. Could you imagine that? Like the beginning of the church, now there's 3,000 people that just accepted Christ. What an incredible problem to have, right? But, but it, it is an issue that they're going to have to deal with. But now in verse number 42, it says this, and they, that is all of those that accepted Christ, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that teaching that they had heard, that preaching that they had heard, they continued steadfastly in it. In other words, they clung to it. It became a part of their life. They truly followed God with their life. And listen, they did it immediately. There was some immediacy to their action. So they heard the word of God preached, they accepted it, and then immediately they began to put it into practice. Let me ask you this question. When God speaks to your heart, do you follow him immediately? Because oftentimes I feel, I feel as though, and maybe this is just me, but oftentimes I feel as though when God speaks to us, we want to delay. And we want to make sure, like, God, I don't know that you're actually calling me to that. Rather than just surrendering ourselves to God and saying, you know what, God, you've spoken to me about this, and now I'm, I'm surrendering it to you. Maybe it's already happened in this conference. I mean, we've had two great nights of preaching. But where God's word has been, ha- has been exposited and clearly explained to us for two straight nights, four, four different messages, and maybe God has spoken to your heart in some way, and you're just holding back something from him. W- why? What are we waiting on? Why, why aren't we willing to just say, you know what, God, you're speaking to me about this. I'm surrendering this area of my life to you. These people in the book of Acts immediately responded. So there was an immediacy to their action, their following of God. They didn't wait. They, they, they immediately began to act. Can I say this too? There's, there ought to be some immediate involvement in your local church. I know oftentimes you might hear as young adults, you might hear, you are the church of tomorrow. Can I tell you, that's not true. You're the church of today. Like your churches are your churches. Ultimately, there's God, they're, they're God's churches. We know that, right? I think we can all agree to that. Your church is God's church. But the fact is, is that you are an incredibly important demographic in your local church. Your churches need you. And they don't just need you there. They don't just need you present in the seats. They do, but your churches need you involved. And I know I'm probably preaching to the choir. I know in the game yesterday, all of you stood up when when Ray was asking how you're involved in your local churches. And that was an incredible thing to see. But your churches need you. They need your gifts. They need your skills, the talents, the ability, the natural talents that God has given you, your learned abilities. Your church needs those. And God has given those things to you for a purpose. Are you using them? Are they being put to work? And so there was an immediacy to their action here. They're following Christ and they do it immediately. The the, the same day they were added to the church, about 3,000 souls, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. But not only was there an immediacy that I see here, there was intentionality. Look down at verse number 42. I just talked about it. But they continued steadfastly, continuing. This was a mark of the authenticity of the decision that they had just made. They're continuing. 
The, the, the fact that they didn't just make a decision and then go another way. You know, it's easy at a conference like this oftentimes for us to make a decision, go back home, and forget about the card that we put on the rock. You know what I mean? And it's easy for us to come to a conference where we spend hours upon hours upon hours for days in a row really studying and involving ourselves in God's word and maybe putting aside some of the other distractions that are typically there in our lives. And God speaks to us and we make a decision and we come to an altar and we fill out a card and we stick it on a rock, but then we get home and we get back into our routine and nothing really changes. There was not only immediacy, there was some intentionality to their decision here. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They kept studying on their own. Would, would you just make this commitment to yourself and really to God? But would you, would you determine, maybe even this morning, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to continue steadfastly in what I hear this week. I'm not just going to make a decision at TNS and then go home and forget about it. So there was immediacy, there was intentionality, and we've got to move just for sake of time. But then I want you to see, thirdly, there was some urgency. There was some urgency in their life at this point. So they gave themselves to prayer. Look at verse number 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, that is their teaching, and fellowship, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Prayer became a priority in their lives. There was a devotion to prayer. If you read the book of Acts, what you're going to find, I don't have time to go through all these references this morning, but what you're going to find is they prayed about everything. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 31, they prayed for boldness. Acts chapter 6 and verse number 6, they prayed before they begin to choose the first deacons. Acts chapter 9, they prayed for signs and for wonders resulting in great growth in the church. Acts chapter 10, they pray about bringing the gospel to the Gentiles in a new people group and on and on and on we could go prayer became an essential part of their life and I think in a culture that has forgotten God prayer is not important to us so I would ask you this morning in your own personal life how important is prayer like is prayer something that you do just before a meal or just before bed, or just before, you know, when, when you first wake up in the morning? Or is prayer something that's truly important in your life? Like, I mean, the, the, Paul says, pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Pray about everything in your life. Pr pray about everything. And that's what they did. With urgency, they prayed. And God answered their prayers in honestly amazing ways, in ways they could never imagine, in ways they could never comprehend. And listen, young people, I promise you this. If we would get serious about prayer and we would begin to ask God to do things that we could never think or imagine, God would answer those prayers. Oh, we need revival in this world. Can we agree about that? I mean, when I, when I think about the United States of America, we certainly need revival there. I, I would imagine in Australia, you, you, you want revival here. I would imagine in New Zealand, you, you pray about revival there. We, we need revival all over the world. And I think sometimes we sit back in our seats and we feel like, yeah, but God's not, God's not working in that way anymore. No, that's not true. We're not praying in that way anymore. And so let's get serious about prayer. Let's get serious about, uh, about an urgency, asking God to send revival in our nations, asking God to send revival in our conferences, asking God to send revival amongst our young people, asking God to send revival. There was an urgency to which they lived. So there was immediacy in their fellowship. There was urgency in their fellowship. There was intentionality in their fellowship. But then there was constancy. There was constancy. Look down to verse number 46. And they, once again, the Bible says, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And so this became a daily lifestyle for them. Like it wasn't just when they came to TNS. It wasn't just on Sunday, not Sunday morning when they went to church. It wasn't just a, at, at their midweek service. It wasn't just when they were around their Christian, this was a daily lifestyle. Every day, they continued daily studying God's word. Is, is that a part of your daily practice? 
Not only do you pray, but do you daily, intentionally study the word of God. Make it a part of your life. God, I need you. God, this is something that's important. This is something that I need to immediately do, intentionally do, urgently do, and constantly do. But not only was there fellowship, or excuse me, fellowship, I see secondly here that there was fellowship amongst believers. Look back at verse number 42. They continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now, this is an intimate sharing of themselves. This is the Greek word koinonia. We, we don't really have an English word for it today uh, that, that would actually match it. We think of fellowship as what? Eating, right? At least we do in America. I don't know about you guys. Um, I have hung out with some of the, the Lebanese here, and as Pastor was talking about last night, we went to McDonald's. It was like, I don't know, midnight before we got home, and we were all eating. Uh, but it seems as though that's kind of a, a world culture thing, right? We, we think of fellowship. We think of, of food. We think of sitting, and, and certainly that's part of it. But that's not all that fellowship is. The, the word here is an intimate sharing of oneself. It's actually something that we don't do well today true biblical christian fellowship where we truly love one another where we actually care about one another and we don't just say the words where we actually come together to take care of one another and to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of christ as paul tells the church at galatia right that's the idea here this, this fellowship that is taking place in the, the, the early church and the fellowship that should be taking place in your church is always centered around the person of Jesus Christ. It was centered around who they now were in Christ. Listen, last night, Pastor Skelly and Pastor Moore both talked about your identity in Jesus Christ. You are created in Christ, 1 Corinthians, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And listen, as a new creature in Christ, you ought to care about your fellow believer and live in unity with your fellow believer and in fellowship with your fellow believer in ways that you never did before you were saved. And so that's what the word means here. They, they weren't just eating together. They were. It was much, much deeper than that. It was an intimate sharing of themselves, but then it was a profound caring for one another. Look at verse 44. And all that believed were together. And they had all things in common. Okay, this is not socialism. This is not communism. This is not what, what this verse is talking about. But this was people who saw other people in need. We see it in verse 45. Look at it with me. They sold their possessions and goods. They parted them to all man as every man had need. So here's what's happening. Again, not socialism, not communism. Nobody's telling them they have to sell their stuff and give it away. Nobody's telling them we're taking your stuff and sharing it with other people. This is people looking at other people and saying, you know what? They have a greater need than I do, and I want to meet that need. When was the last time you did that? When was the last time that I looked at somebody and I saw their need and how much greater their need was than me and I humbled myself so that I could meet their need? That's true fellowship. That's true koinonia. That's what we need in our churches. And listen, you are, you are, don't miss this, you are the generation that can bring that. You are the generation that is searching for truth. You are the generation that can bring true fellowship and true koinonia to our churches. And so there was fellowship. They followed God with immediacy, with intentionality, with urgency, with constancy. But then there was fellowship. Finally, finally this morning, there was unity. Look at verse 44. I actually skip on down to verse 46 for sake of time. We already read 44 and 45. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And so his vision not only includes fellowship, it not only includes fellowship, but it includes unity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul tells the church at Corinth, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Listen, if you read the New Testament, what you see in the New Testament is time after time after time after time again, the apostles encouraging the churches to dwell in unity with one another. 
to work together, to strive together for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, I believe that God wants to use this generation to do some of his greatest work that he's ever done. I truly believe that. But I also believe that unless we can learn to dwell together and strive together in unity for the sake of the gospel, that that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Because God loves unity. God loves churches and people who, to, who dwell together in unity. Let me give you these thoughts and I'll be done. Four things that unity requires. Four, four things that unity requires. And by the way, this, is, this has got to be true in your life. Listen to me. If you're not, if these things are not true about you, then you're not dwelling in unity with others. If these things are not true about your church, then your church is not dwelling in unity with one another. So here's four things that, that unity requires. Number one, unity requires deference. You know what I mean by that? You guys know what that word means? Unity requires deference. It requires me to put aside my opinions and my uh, desires and my preferences and really allow others to bring theirs in. Unity requires deference. It's, it's me looking first upon the things of others. It's me humbling myself and allowing other people to have opinions too. That's a hard thing for us to do in a social media culture that's so me-driven, right? But unity requires deference. Number two, unity requires mutual respect. Unity requires mutual respect. Again, something that we have lost in our world today. Respect for other people who might even have differing opinions. Who, who might be on a different side of the political aisle than we are. Who might like a different team than we do, right? But unity requires mutual respect. Us working together in unity requires mutual respect. It requires deference. It requires selflessness. It requires selflessness. Me saying, you know what? I'm going to look upon other people's things before I look at my own things. And then finally, unity requires mutual agreement. Hey, we're going to agree that this is all about him. Unity requires mutual agreement. We're going to agree that this is all about him. It's not about me. You know, it's easy for me to make my life all about me. It's easy for me to make everything all about me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get a lot of money. I'm going to be successful in my job. I'm going to fill in the blank. But unity requires us to mutually agree that this life is not about me. This life is not about you. This life is about him. That's why we've been put here, to radically pursue Jesus Christ. I want you to see what God does to their unity in verse number 47, because God blesses it in ways, again, that only he could do and that we could never imagine. Praising God in verse number 47, and we're done. And having favor with all the people. Why did they have favor with all the people? Because they're dwelling together in unity. Because they're working together. Because they're looking on other people's things rather than on their own things, right? And so now they've had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. God did something only he could do. He blessed their unity. And so listen to me. If God's going to bless your church, if, if God's going to bless you inside of your church, there, there's got to be fellowship. Can we just determine today that we're going to immediately follow God when he calls upon us? That, that we're going to intentionally follow him with urgency. There's got to be fellowship. There's got to be fellowship. We have to learn how to care for one another, how to live in unity with one another. And of course, then there has to be unity. So let me give you that statement one more time. Maybe you didn't write it down at the beginning. You want to write it down here at the end. Here's God's vision for the, for the church to radically pursue Jesus while fellowshipping in unity with other believers for the purpose of worshiping our Savior and making disciples of Jesus Christ. Is that your life? Are you radically pursuing Jesus? Are you fellowshipping with other believers? Are you worshiping together in unity? Are you using the gifts and the, 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 the abilities and the talents that God has given you to bless the other people in your church? Or, or are we just content to seek after our own things? To live for ourselves, 
to make our life all about me, to, 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 to not consider what, what God is, is doing in our hearts, is that what we are content with or do we want more? Father, would you help us this morning to want more? Would you help us to be people who would intentionally and immediately and urgently follow you? God, would you help us to fellowship in unity with one another, striving together for the sake of the gospel? Lord, I thank you so much for the time that you've given us this morning, for the attention that has been given to your word, and I pray that your word has has been a blessing, a challenge, conviction in hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.